trauma care is getting effed. My name is Dr. Rich Hilton, and you're watching my channel, Knife Skills. Before I took a break for the summer, after all, I'm a Canadian trauma surgeon, and the busiest time for trauma in our hospitals is the summer. I made a video talking about some of the big changes happening to trauma care, specifically a video talking about the addition of exsanguinating hemorrhage as the first thing we look for in the primary survey. Well, the primary survey is having other changes, and one of those changes is that it's getting effed. They're adding F to the primary survey. Now, to understand the significance of this, let's go back to the basics. Trauma care is based upon advanced trauma life support. This is a set of protocols, an educational system, a set of tools, really, that guide trauma care providers on the best way to manage trauma patients. And ATLS starts with the primary survey. The primary survey focuses on the most serious injuries first. You deal with those, then you move on to other, maybe less life-threatening injuries. It sets up a priority when it comes to managing patients. And like in the original video, you take care of exsanguinating hemorrhage first, then you move on to airway, then to breathing, then to circulation, then to neurological status, and finally, in the primary survey, you expose a patient and make sure you're not missing any other obvious life-threatening injuries. Now, at this point in the primary survey, traditionally, you'll be thinking about adjuncts to the primary survey. And those are things like blood work, things like a chest x-ray or a pelvis x-ray or an ultrasound. But also at this stage, you need to be thinking about other decisions for this patient, like where they go or what type of specialty care they might need. And this is where the Fs in the primary survey are now going to be helping trauma providers. And it's really not just one F, it's multiple Fs. So let's get into them. The first F that I think should be part of the primary survey is facility. Now if you're a trauma patient and you're seeing me, I work in a level one trauma center. And in almost all situations, in the level one trauma center, that's the best place for you to be. Only in the most serious burn patients would I consider transferring a patient out to another hospital. However, in my community, there's so many patients who are not being treated in trauma centers and they need to be transferred to a higher level of care. And at this point in time, you need to consider your facility and whether it's appropriate to take care of a trauma patient at this time. The next is family. Now we've known for a long time that the presence of family in pediatric trauma and pediatric resuscitations can relieve anxiety in the patients and can actually help the parents understand and appreciate what's going on. And that can improve outcomes. Even in adult populations, considering family involvement is extremely important. Family might understand the mechanism of injury in a way that you don't understand, or they might understand the patient's past health that could consider elements of the resuscitation. Family might actually help you guide goals of care in an elderly patient who's undergoing trauma. And that leads me to the next step, and that is future planning. We're dealing with a growing aging population. And in this population, so many patients are having serious multi-system trauma, even after low energy mechanism type injuries. And then oftentimes, these elderly patients will have some future plans in mind. They may not want to have ICU care. They may not want to have blood products or be intubated. They may have a very specific plan on how they want to die. And by involving family and thinking about future planning, you can guide your resuscitation to the patient's needs and the patient's desires. At the end of the day, we're here to serve those patients. And related to this elderly population that's having more and more trauma, the last F that I consider is frailty and functional status. An elderly patient who's had a trauma is gonna have a much different outcome than a younger, healthy patient, all the other things considered. And that needs to be communicated to the patient, needs to be communicated to the family, so they know what to expect as they're going through the hospital system and being treated for trauma. But also that issue of frailty can impact what you do for resuscitation, the types of concerns you might have. If the patient is frail, they're much more likely to die from relatively minor injuries. The classic thing we talk about are rib fractures, and those can cause pneumonia and ultimately death in elderly populations. When a younger patient might have the same number of ribs, they might be able to be discharged home. So thinking about frailty and functional status is so important when you're dealing with trauma care. So those are the addition 
of the Fs in our primary survey. After that, you can move on to the secondary survey and really focus on definitive treatment and management. And that ultimately is what we do in advanced trauma life support. For nearly 50 years, trauma care has remained unchanged with airway up front, then breathing and circulation. But new research and new tools have shown us that we need to make some changes to our primary survey. And I'm excited to say that we're adding exsanguinating hemorrhage up front, then airway, then breathing, then circulation, then disability and exposure. And finally, the important Fs, the Fs that guide us in our decision-making after the primary survey has been completed. If you're interested in watching more about trauma care, I'd want you to stick around and watch this video down below where I talk about the primary survey and why we're adding exsanguinating hemorrhage up front. Once again, thank you for watching. My name is Dr. Rich Hilsden. I appreciate every single like and subscribe and have a great day.